thank you everybody for joining us tonight for our uh, very special Let's Go Rural, How Do I Get There Allied Health conversation. My name is Colleen Lindholm, and I have a few of my colleagues um, with me on the call tonight. So I have Alicia Fox and Jennifer Best is on here. I'm going to be helping me. Um, I see that there's also Jill Tilly and Anita Fayan is on here as well. And um, we are a rural community consultant team for RPAP, and which is the Rural Health Professions Action Plan. So um, before we get going into our fully jam-packed agenda, um, I would like to hand it over to our consultant, Jennifer Best, and she is going to um, do the land acknowledgement piece for us. So over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Colleen. Hi, everyone. As you just heard, I'm Jennifer Best, and I'm one of the community consultants here with RPAP. Uh, I'm privileged to provide you greetings from Mistuwayu, which is a Cree word for where the three rivers meet, or in English, Fort McMurray. RPAP pr proudly acknowledges the traditional lands and treaties of six, seven, and eight upon which we live, work, and play. They are home to many First Nations and Métis settlements. We recognize that all Albertans are treaty people and have a responsibility to understand our history so that we can honor the past, be aware of the present, and create a just and caring future. We are committed to protecting these lands and to our ongoing learning in the spirit of truth and reconciliation. Thank you all for joining us today. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. Okay, so next slide, Alicia. Um, we're just going to take a couple minutes and just let you know who our PEP is. And um, we celebrated our 30th anniversary last year, so we have actually been around for a while. We work with rural communities across the province, supporting them with tools and resources to attract and retain health professionals. We also work with health professionals offering various education and professional development opportunities for them to increase their existing skills. We have a team of community rural consultants who work and live across the entire province, supporting more than 45 community committees, which equates into about 150 to 160 different communities with their attraction and retention efforts. So next slide. So here is our map showing where all of these committees are. So have a look and see if you can find where you are in Alberta. So just some examples of the work that committees do. They welcome and integrate new physicians, new health professionals and their families into the community. It could also um, look like a community-wide appreciation for the local healthcare professionals. Some committees have put together weekend experiences for post-secondary students where medical, nursing, and other university and college students come to the community for a weekend, experiencing what it will be like to work, live, and play there. They're very popular events. Another popular opportunity um, are events created just for high school students in rural Alberta that showcase various health career options right in your community. This is a full day experience where students like yourself hands on, have hands-on exper experience with medical skills alongside your local health professionals who are sharing their stories of how they got to where they are in their careers and why they work, live and play in a rural community. So while these events are not able to happen right now due to COVID, we do anticipate that they will be happening again at some point. But in the meantime, we are going to be offering Let's Go Rural events such as tonight. So first up, to talk with you guys, we have Sid Savska to talk with you about what is allied health and why rural. She is a senior advisor for all health services, health sciences positions within Alberta Health Services. She attends conferences and career fairs for these positions, trying to attract them to, to AHS. She collaborates with unions, professional associations, post-secondary institutions, and other health authorities across Canada. So over to you, Sid. Thanks for that great introduction. Let me just set up my slide here. So my name is uh, Sydney Saviskoff. I'm the Senior Advisor for Allied Health Provincial Strategies, which is a division of uh, Human Resources, and I fall under Talent Solutions, and I'm with Alberta Health Services. Um, I've been with Alberta Health Services for 16 years, and as you'll find as you go through your 
path in life, sometimes you think you're going somewhere and the path gives you a turn. So um, I uh, started, I watched the show Aaron Brockovich and fell in love uh, with law and became a paralegal, went back to school, um, did law for 12 years. And one of my clients or one of the lawyers that um, I worked with at the law firm uh, became a lawyer at Alberta Health Services and brought me into the organization. And from there, I had a cl an old client that became the director of recruitment and she pulled me into her portfolio and ta-da, look at where I am today uh, in, in talent solutions. So you never know which way your, your career path is gonna take you. Always keep an open mind. So what is Allied Health? Well, Allied Health is a post-secondary educated healthcare professions that are not nursing and they're not, do not doctors. So they tend to have an education requirement of two to up to seven plus years. So there's that post, post um, high school um, that you need to be um, in allied health. So the most common professions are occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech language pathologists, social workers, audiologists, um, dietitians, paramedics, therapy assistant, what we're, which is what we're gonna talk about today, and respiratory therapists, which we're gonna talk about today. And just to give you an idea, um, as of today, we have 313 respiratory therapist vacancies and 198 therapy assistant vacancies. So that's how high of demand those professions are. And why go rural? Well, you get the best experiences in rural. So you work closely with other allied health professionals. So because you're uh, in a smaller site, you're, the, the professionals that work around you work really closely with you because um, you will be filling in gaps in, in their performance or assisting them with their work. Um, so that gives you that exposure or cross training to these professionals, which is great. A lot of our therapy assistants end up going back to school and becoming uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, audiologists, because um, their passion, their passion to grow is there. Um, the cost of living may be much lower in a rural area, but in Alberta Health Services, your pay is the same no matter where you're located in the province. So it's the same wage as what you would be making in an urban setting. Um, there's potentially a shorter commute. I don't know. I'm, I'm from Calgary, and I can tell you um, I live about five minutes away from our office, and it takes me 30 minutes to get there. So. Um, there's less competition for positions in rural areas. So in the urban settings, uh, we tend to get a significantly large amount of applications. In rural, we're lucky if we get one. Uh, so the competition is way lower there. there. You get a sense of community. And what I mean by that is you may have a patient that comes in that, um, you know, tells you a bit of their story and uh, you end up realizing that you might know their grandkids or you might know their mom. And um, so there's that sense of community where you're assisting people in your community uh, as a healthcare worker. And then we all know the quality of life is much better in uh, a rural community. There's that, more of that work-life balance, um, which, you tend not to get as much in an urban center. And that's it for me. Oh, I do wanna mention that, that we are Canada's top employer for uh, young people. We've uh, been that, I believe, seven or eight years in a row now. So something to keep in mind. Thank you so much, Sid, for that great information. So next we have, um, from Medicine Hat College, we have Preston Sloan, and he's going to talk to folks um, a little bit about the um, things that maybe high school students should be thinking about as they 
um, are looking at applying to a post-secondary institution, and then as well, a little bit about the programs um, there at Medicine Hat College. So uh, over to you, Preston. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Preston Sloan. I'm, I'm a physical therapist, and I'm the coordinator and an instructor in the Occupational Physical Therapist Assistant Program at Medicine Hat College. Um, we often abbreviate that um, and say the OTA PTA uh, program uh, at Medicine Hat College. And I'm also going to speak a little bit about the speech language pathologist assistant um, program or SLPA program at Medicine Hat College as these two programs are very um, closely knitted at Medicine Hat College. And although I don't coordinate or teach in the speech language uh, pathologist assistant program, I am very much involved in what's going on there. Most of you probably know where Medicine Hat is, but some of you may not. Medicine Hat's located in the southeast corner of the, of the province. Um, we definitely have a lot of, um, as most cities, lots of rural areas with um, uh, small towns surrounding us. Um, and we do also have a lot of um, strong ties to Saskatchewan as well, but in rural area Saskatchewan, um, because of our uh, proximity to the Alberta-Saskatchewan border to our east. So um, Sid did a really good introduction to, I guess, working in allied health uh, in a rural area. And she stated that these positions usually range between two years all the way up to maybe seven or eight years. Um, uh, in the therapist assistant programs, these are two year uh, diploma programs. And as a an assistant, a physical therapist assistant, or an occupational therapist assistant, or an SLP assistant, um, you are working under the direction of a therapist, and you're helping individuals achieve um, multiple or a variety of different goals um, or different um, um, different outcomes, whether it be being able to do certain activities, um, being able to get pain control, uh, maybe working on mobility, communication, and, and things like that. Um, there's opportunities um, to work in very, uh, well, vast a variety of settings, um, from hospitals to rehab centers, continuing care facilities, schools, community and government agencies, and more. Um, I coordinate our students as they go on pr practicum, and what that is is where they work as a student um, with a supervisor in the field of what they're going to school for. So they would go work with a physical therapist and, or a physical therapist assistant for a period of six weeks. And as we send our students out, um, so many of our students spend time in rural areas and have a great opportunity and great experience in those rural settings. Um, as Sid's all, already talked about the benefits of that. One of the unique things, and I think very, um, important things that I wanted to um, bring up tonight is that our program offers both an on-site delivery, which means you come to Medicine Hat, you spend two years with us here in Medicine Hat um, to get your diploma. We also offer a distance learning or distributed learning um, a delivery method. And what that is, is students stay where they're currently living or you can live wherever you want and your courses, the majority of your courses are done online and are done what we call asynchronously. And all that means is that you don't have to show up online for classes at a specific time. Um, there's course material that's presented to you. Maybe there's online um, videos to watch, voiceover PowerPoints, things like that. You work at your own pace um, and you're able to get your diploma that way. Um, typically our students who do the distance learning, uh, it takes them a little bit longer than two years. I would say typically it takes three, three and a half years for the students who choose that, um, um, that delivery method. But it's a good option for students who want to stay at home, who live in rural areas and don't want to move um, all the way to Medicine Hat. And so that's a, that's a neat opportunity uh, for students um, who don't wanna move away from their rural areas. And there's lots of transfer credit options as well with this program being a two-year diploma. Many of our students do go on and do um, professional programs such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech language uh, pathology as well. 
The second thing that I wanted to talk about was what, what are the requirements or what would I think of um, if I'm is interested in something um, like being a therapist assistant. Um, these requirements are taken right off of our website and I have the two links below. Um, I don't think you'll have access to this, but I, I definitely can send these to the organizers if um, pe people are wanting to have these links. It's just the Medicine Hat College website. And if you search under the search tab, uh, OTA PTA or SLPA, it'll come up with our um, program pages. But our, our um, requirements are, I will say somewhat easier, quite a bit easier than many professional programs that you would think would be comparable. And so there is a requirement for, an in, for a 30 level English and biology, and then um, two other or additional 30 level uh, subjects. One that has to be a 30 level science or uh, math 30. Um, another interesting thing about our program that is different than something maybe like nursing is I know the nursing program. I mean, I know lots about the one at Medicine Hat College specifically because I'm, I'm involved a little bit there, but it's very competitive. Um, and our, our program, I would say, is competitive in the fact that we always have enough students. Or we always have a waiting list, but our admission is actually a first come first serve basis, meaning of all the applicants um, that apply, we don't go through and take the individuals who have the highest grades. As long as you meet the requirements, if you were the first one to apply and you met all the requirements, you'd be the first one admitted. And so this is a good opportunity for students who may feel like, you know what, I'm getting 60s, I'm getting 70s. I'm not as competitive to try and get into some of these programs where the students who are getting 80s and 90s are getting in. Um, as long as you're on the ball and, and applying promptly when our application opens, um, then uh, many students are able to get into this program, um, you know, who are getting those 60s and 70s uh, in high school. So that's, that's a good opportunity as well and one that I wanted to point out. I, um, I should have put a link on here and I apologize for that, but um, the best way to get, find out more information about the program if you're interested is just searching Medicine Hat College and, and typing in speech language pathologist assistant or OTA PTA or occupational therapist assistant, physical therapist assistant, and it'll bring up all of our information on our program page. The other option that I thought would be simple is you can write down my email here and I, I'm more than happy to answer any emails from um, students. If you're looking at applying, if you're wondering uh, more specifics, I'm more than happy to help you. Um, and so this is my email. Uh, feel free to email me here and ask any questions if any come up about uh, more about our programs at Medicine Hat College. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have a recent graduate of the program that you just heard all about. So um, Victor is originally from Brazil and he came to Canada about six years ago to play soccer for Medicine Hat College. He has been working in health sciences since he was 18 and is currently working in Excel physiotherapy um, at, in Medicine Hat. So over to you, Victor, to tell your story. All right, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I am originally from Brazil, and I think uh, I do have like a few topics that I would like to talk to you guys about. Um, and the first is my background, right? I, I come from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I don't know if all of you know. Uh, and that compared to Medicine Hat, to put in perspective, only my neighborhood in Brazil is bigger than the city that I live on today. So... Um, talking rural is still a little, it's still confusing to me to kind of understanding everything, uh, coming from such a huge city and coming into Medicine Hat, which is a quite small town, uh, all the dynamics, uh, change and everything changes a little bit. Right. So how do I got here? Um, it was already mentioned that I got a, I got a scholarship to play uh, soccer for the college. Uh, I was just about to graduate actually from my program back in Brazil I originally took physical education um, I've I played soccer for 21 years since I was uh, six years old until I graduated uh, and sports and act, being active and exercising has always been part of my life um, I did have physiotherapy as an early age close to my family my dad my brother and myself we all went to physio 
um, quite a lot. And I always liked to be involved with the rehab part and with the exercise portion of all of it. Um, so when I did start my physical education university back in Brazil, I started coaching soccer right away. I also started uh, working in gyms and I always loved to work in forests with uh, the older population. And uh, which is a little trickier than when you get a younger person coming to the gym. Usually they either want to lose weight or get in shape and get fit. Um, but when we look more to the older population, we do have a, a bigger variety of uh, goals that they would have. Um, but anyways, I did took my course there and I moved to Manhattan. I had took my couple of years of English. Uh, I still had to learn how to speak English to live here. So that was quite a battle for a couple of years. Um, then I did join the uh, physiotherapy assistant program at the college. Um, Preston was one of my instructors. Um, it was an easy choice because I think that, again, coming from a big city, I, I wanted a change in my life. And I did find that change and it was quite overwhelming in the beginning, that feeling of where is everybody? But at the same time, uh, and that's probably my focus of uh, my experience here and why work in rural and in the health area, which is the sense of community and the relationships that you build, right? Uh, coming from a huge city, I'm not saying that we don't have relationships, of course we do, but the sense of community and really the care that we have for our clients is totally different here. And um, that's definitely one of the main focus for why I got here. Um, my experience of the medicine and college could not have been better. Um, and when I say that I involve all parts, I involve all my instructors, I involve the directors, I involve my teammates, my classmates, everybody was super helpful. Um, especially in the beginning of the program, I was still learning how to communicate a little better and all of that. And everything was kind of new. So um, the support that I got from the college, not just from the, my instructors and all of that, but also from my classmates and teammates, uh, I never got that sense of, you know, help in a bigger city. And that was a, that was quite a highlight for me. Um, one of the things as well that the, uh, the program provided me uh, when we finish our program in our second year, our six months um, at the end or last semester is just full of practicum. And I had an experience to go for three placements and all of them were different from each other. I did a physiotherapy clinic. I worked in an old folks uh, rehab home, which was very, very surprisingly good and special uh, experience that I had. And I also worked the AHS at the hospital here more in a, acute situation which is totally different so have been through all of those even for a short period of time he really made my choice very easy I was like I would come in after work and put my head on the pillow and be really help happy that I was so helpful for so many people and I think the level of appreciation that people have towards you as a worker not just in the health uh, service I think it's very special as well. And that's definitely one of the things that I highlight in the rural communities. Um, and I also wanna talk about a little bit about the sports with the college and how that came out. And uh, yes, it was very hard in the beginning. It's a lot of work, but I can guarantee to all of you um, that are in high school right now. And if you think about play and any sports and how difficult that would be to be at a college and maintain a good level of, you know, grades and all of that with the sports. There's no better place to me than do that than in a small community because of that sense of help and all, everybody kind of works together and everybody helps each other. Um, I was always made sure to be told that if you need any help, we always here for you and press on, as one of my instructors, he was there for that and he, he can advocate for that for sure. Um, everybody in the rural community kind of works together as a big family and I absolutely love that. Um, again, a lot of work to be an athlete, uh, student athlete, but definitely paid off. Great opportunity, met some amazing people. 
um, in in my uh, in my path here. Um, and last thing that I want to talk about is why do I do what I do and why do I love what I do? I've been working with people generally since I was 18. It's been good 11 to 12 years already with that. And I can see myself working with any different fields. Um, the pleasure that I get, and again, especially in a rural area that we really have to um, help is even smaller communities that come to our town as we are kind of like a bit of a center for uh, the smaller communities surround, surrounding uh, Medicine Hat. And um, it's very, very pleasant to be working uh, with those people. And uh, from a client perspective as well, because I've been to Fizio here, um, and from what our clients tell us is that people that have been to rehab in bigger cities, comparing to the small town, it's not just the quality of the service, but the quality of the, the quality of the service uh, and the, the level of care that we all have towards everybody. And I think that's that's the highlight um, for any of you that you live in a small community and you think about going to a bigger city. I wouldn't do that. Um, some of the some of the the points are already uh, shown here, and why would it be good? The price wise and the opportunity. There's always a lot of jobs available, but really focus on what's gonna make you happy. And I'm pretty sure that being in a small area and working with uh, the health services is definitely very rewarding. Um, I think that's all I have for you guys. I'll be at the end for any questions that you guys may have to me. And it was a pleasure to talk to you all. Awesome. Thank you so much. So up next, we have Chantel and Courtney to chat with you about their pathway and experiences of being rural therapy assistants. So Chantel graduated in 2019 from Northwest College's Physical Therapy Assistant online program. She currently works in St. Paul, and at the healthcare center in both acute care and outpatient physiotherapy. Her favorite thing about working in a rural hospital is she gets to help treat such a variety of individuals with many different conditions. Courtney studied at Red Deer College, now, now Polytechnic, and she graduated from the Occupational and Physical Therapy Assistant Program, which is a two-year program. She lives just outside of Derwent, which is 40-ish minutes from St. Paul and works as an OTA at the St. Paul Hospital in the long-term care, as well as home care. She likes working where there is, where there is, she feels she has a better relationship with the residents, as well as her coworkers. It's a smaller facility, so there's time to get to know everyone and their stories. And she says working rural gives her a variety uh, of work and gives her more responsibilities. So over to you, Chantel and Courtney. Uh, hi there, I'm Chantel. Um, so like, like uh, she mentioned there, I graduated from the Physical Therapy Assistant Online Diploma Program at Northwest College, which is uh, based out of Edmonton, but I was able to do the majority of it fully online. So the great thing about that was I was able to live at home and continue to work while I was in school. And that way uh, I didn't even have to take out any student loans for college, which was fantastic. Uh, so how I got into uh, this career, originally right out of high school, I was actually working as a horseback riding instructor. And I ended up being able to work with several individuals with uh, some pretty profound physical disabilities. And I thought that was pretty darn cool. So when I started looking for a college program, I thought I would love to get a background, a solid background in some sort of rehabilitation. So when I was looking for my program, I wanted something that was relatively inexpensive, something that could be done in just a couple of years. Um, and like I said, mostly online. And I was looking to be able to find a job pretty easily after finishing college. And if you check out like any job boards like Indeed, you'll see that there's always therapy assistant postings on there available. Um, and I also wanted something that could easily ladder into further education if, if I wanted to continue my education afterwards. 
So if you if you look at most bachelor's programs, um, there's potential to receive a significant number of transfer credits for a therapy assistant diploma, which is excellent. I find the most rewarding thing about my work is when I get to see individuals go from really struggling with their physical problems and, and disabilities to overcoming them and being able to go back to uh, living their life the way they want to. It's, it's a great process to see and very, very rewarding. Uh, something that epitomizes that idea is this one client that I remember really clearly. She was in the hospital after suffering from a stroke and the therapist and I went and assessed her and the therapist figured she was probably strong enough to stand. So we managed to get her sitting up on the edge of the bed and we helped her into standing. And I was just standing there uh, focusing on keeping her upright and balanced. And I just felt her arms wrap around me and she just, she was crying and she said, oh my gosh, I haven't been able to stand up out of bed in over a week. And it meant so much to her. And I just, yeah, that moment I remember so well, and it was extremely rewarding. Uh, my favorite thing about working in the rural hospital specifically is that our caseload is so variable. Uh, it's my understanding that in a lot of the bigger city hospitals, you often end up working in a very specific sector of the hospital. So for example, you'll be working exclusively with individuals who had joint replacements or something like that. Whereas out here in the rural hospitals, we see everybody and anybody that comes through the door with any condition that needs our help. So that's really, really pretty cool. Uh, it keeps things very interesting. You never know what you're gonna see every single day. Um, something I would have told myself if I was looking for a job in a rural area as a teenager. Um, if you're looking for a career where you're constantly on your feet, interacting with clients, uh, it's very personable. You're always using critical thinking and problem solving skills. Uh, you'll likely enjoy a job as a therapy assistant. Working in a small rural town, you definitely get to know the locals and they'll get to know you. So you gotta be prepared for that. And if that's something you would like, then then a rural job is definitely a great option. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Courtney? Hi. Yeah, so I graduated from Red Deer College or Polytechnic now from the OPTA program, uh, which is just a two-year program. And so how I got into that was I was in the pre-health sciences program and because um, I knew I wanted to do something in the healthcare field, but I wasn't too sure. And one day we got to shadow program and I chose the optics. because I wasn't really sure what that what even was. So I went, went there and spent a day with the optic kids and realized that's something I actually really want to do. So then I applied and I got in. So yeah, that was how I got into that program. Um, why I chose to work rural was pretty much, I grew up in a small town, so, and I'm, I'm very family oriented, so I really like having that close knit with um, the patients and even the coworkers. So working in St. Paul is really great for that. Um, I work in the hospital in the long-term care facility. So, and our long-term care facility isn't the biggest, we got about 30 beds. Um, so you really have a chance to get to know each and every, every individual there and get to know their story and how they got there and just who they are while even working with them. Um, so on the occupational side of things that I do in long-term care is I help with the maintenance of the wheelchairs and make sure their safety. I I also help with some range of motion and just exercises with them. Um, and I also am in home care. Uh, that's a really fun part because you get to get a whole variety of things. Um, you work really close with the nurses and the physio therapists and the occupational therapists. And you're able to help 
um, make sure people are able to stay in their homes and so they don't have to leave. So we get equipment and just do exercises and you really get to know them and because you're going into their homes and lots of them make you feel like family and you're welcome anytime. Um, so that's one thing I really love about my job is just really getting to know the people and feeling and having that close feeling with them where sometimes in a big city you don't always get that so one that's one nice thing about rural is uh you get to know them um when I was a teenager I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do um but I definitely would have told myself just go out and try um it doesn't hurt so it's good to have uh, this kind of education and if you really do like interacting with people and getting to know them this would be a great career for you um, I've only been working a couple months with AHS but I'm loving every minute of it um, one nice thing also about working in rural and especially home care you're not doing the same thing every time each client is um, their need have a different needs so Every day is different and you have a variety of things you get to do. So it doesn't get boring. Um, some days it gets very interesting because you got to come up with ideas on how you're going to make things work with the client. And yeah, it's, it's always fun working rural. And yeah, that's kind of my story. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. We'll continue on with our next presenter, and um, it's Patty Winchuk, and she's been working for AHS and Children's Rehab as a speech language therapy assistant since 2005, and now works with preschool clients. Four years ago, she was trained as an EHDI, Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Screener, which is a program that screens hearing in newborn babies. And she also works as an SLPA and is learning some OTA skills as well. And Patty, I'll let you explain all those acronyms uh, when we are chatting. So over to you, Patty. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, just a little bit of history here about myself. I've always wanted, like from the time I was a child, I always wanted to work with children. And so I got this job 17 years ago um, as a speech language pathology assistant and have loved every minute of it. Um, uh, I love working with these kiddos and their families as partners to better their lives. I'm working in the community that I was raised in and my children were raised in. So that's, it's such a good feeling to be able to give back to the community that helped raise me. Um, on a little side note, and this truly did happen, um, I was working in the school that I went to and my children went to, and I looked over one day and I, I didn't do it, but there was my name scratched in a desk <laughs> from many, many years before. I don't know who did that, but that's, that's one of the things that happens when you work in a small community. <laughs> um, and so it, basically, I just want to say it's, it's amazing it's an amazing feeling to be part of the community and to give back. Um, and a little bit, of, uh, a little bit discussing what I was trained to do four years ago. So that's something that happens a lot in AHS. You get trained on the job as well and expand your role. Um, I was chosen to be the EDI screener, which is the early hearing and detection intervention program. It's a newer program in Alberta, um, in the, in Edmonton, Calgary and Red Deer, uh, babies are screened before they leave the hospital, but in the smaller communities, they can't have someone in the hospital all the time. So the parents come to see us. So I actually do screenings in Wetaskiwin, um, sometimes Pinoka, Stetler and Musquachis. So, um, and it's, it's a fascinating program and it's definitely been one of my favorite parts of my job. And in the most recent little bit of my job, Working as an SLPA, I've also been doing some training as an OTA as well. So it's it's been a good thing. It's I wouldn't give back those 17 years for anything. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, next up, we have Ellen Buchanan, and she is a respiratory therapist in Bonneville. So Ellen, I noticed that you're on the call. So it, 
you want to take a couple minutes and just share a little bit about your role as a respiratory therapist in rural and why high school students um, would consider that as a potential pathway for them? Well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I, I tried many different jobs. I thought, uh, what's my highest mark in high school? And I thought, well, maybe I'll pursue jobs in the courses that I got my highest mark in. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So I was looking at office jobs, administrative jobs, not really what I wanted to do. So I went back to the drawing board and tried different things like drafting, operating equipment. One day I ran into my you took a look at the course at their open house. And uh some job shadowing in the hospital because you have to do a little bit of research on a course if you want to um, be considered for it at night. And when I saw what the job entailed, I didn't wait to your job. So how did I get there? So I immediately went over to Nate and I applied, but I found out that I didn't have some grades that were cutting the mustard for that course. So I applied anyway and I went off and I, I brought up the park and I took it all in the summer school. And when I went to me, um, they, did, they did take my registration and I did get, get uh, the same course. I only speak on about 25 people every year. It's, uh, it's uh, quite an intensive course. They have labs. They have a lot of things that they, um, they need just a, a limited number of people to do. So when I got into the job, um, when I got into the job, you actually had to apply to a hospital, and the hospital sponsored you into Nate. So when I went in thirty years ago, <laughs> um, my first year was at Nate. So you did all the labs, you did a lot of your um, basic courses, and my second year was spent in a hospital that sponsored me, and I did all my practicum there while I was learning um, the rest of the material for my course. And at the end of that, then you write a hospital exam and you write a NATE exam. But now they've changed it. Um, it's three years and everything is done in NATE. And they send you out on practicums to different, different health centers with different specialties. So um, the application actually goes right to NATE and you apply to NATE. Uh, why I love my job, it offers a lot, a lot of variety every day. Is, I'm always on the move. I never know where, what each day is going to bring. Uh, but, but when the day comes along, my training makes me ready, ready for each day. Uh, I make a difference with where you want to work with. And I'm always working on new projects to help my patients perform. I met people from all over the world because we're also able to network with many other people across the world through conferences. I'm always learning about new scientific advances and getting new partnerships. I use my knowledge to teach others. So the job entitles not only working on site, um, you can be part of the community, you can be part of home care, you can be part of a specialty, um, you can, you can uh, work in the the school, you can become a trainer at NATE, but the actual job in the hospital is working with patients in the emergency department, in the acute care department, and also doing community programs for these patients. When I tell a teen about considering rural, um, I started off in the city, so I was in a large hospital. In a large hospital, it's 12 hour shift and you're not just the only therapist there, you're a group of therapists. So when you come in in the morning for a report, um, you each get assigned a specific area in the hospital. So you do your 12 hours in a specific area. So you might be in the emergency department all day, you might be on the floors all day, you might be in the blood gas lab, but your day is wherever they assign you and, and you run with the beeper. So every time somebody needs you for something, they beep you. So for 12 hours, you're just getting beeped and going to each job. When you move out, when I moved out to Bonneville, I, I, I had been a therapist for five or six years. Uh, I, I came into a rural hospital and I, I realized I'm the only one. So 
So it was a good thing I got a little taste of all the different departments because when you're the only one, then you have to do a little bit of everything. So I covered all the areas and being assigned to one. But I'm not really alone because I'm still part of a different group, a different group called the Allied Health. So we all work together, we all meet together, and we all collaborate together. So Allied Health consists of physiotherapists, occupational therapists, audiologists and recreational therapists. So we all work as a group and, and we find there's a lot of crossover with our jobs with the patients. So we work together. I felt like I was able to spread my wings when I went into the rural area. I could do a lot more. And some of my work, um, all some of my work, the docs refer to me, they refer patients to me so I can book part of my day. And the rest of the day is whatever comes my way. So I can plan clinics. I can work with patients and family. I can do some teaching. I can work out in the community or I can work in with community patients on, on different programs like pulmonary rehab programs, tobacco projects in the school. I can even participate in some of the research projects that come out of the city and, and, and do some of those projects from my area and send all my data to the city. So it, it, it's really neat. And then I attend conferences all over all over Canada so I can learn even more than what I learned at NAIC. A funny story about my job. I was asked on a panel for a high school one year. Uh, we had a project called Flight Path 2000. It was a school tobacco project. And the panel included a non-smoker, a smoker, and the smoker was one of my patients I talked to becoming myself. When my patient came to the gym to sit up on the stage with us, she was so nervous. She said, you didn't tell me there was going to be this many people here. We said, oh, well, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. So she did. And she told her story. We all told her stories. and answered all the questions from the audience. She did really good. So I was pretty proud of her for stepping up. And one, one day, a couple weeks later, she saw me on the street and she told me, she said, you know, she said, one of the kids from that, from that high school actually approached me on the street and gave me a big hug and thanked me and, and, and she thanked me because she said she really appreciated that I, I uh, went up on stage and talked about my experiences with smoking and she said she quit because of my talk and she wanted to she wanted she wanted my patient to know that she had quit smoking and she was really so happy so I was we were both in tears we thought that was pretty neat I can tell a lot of stories about patients. I've spent so many years. I've actually been in, in, in this job for 37 years. So coming out of high school, didn't know what I wanted. And I found a job that I just loved, and I'm still doing it. Uh, it takes some time to get into me. Uh, it takes some work to get into me. But there's a, a place on process. So when you look on there, it tells you what and talking with some respiratory therapists, helping you get uh, for an interview into the course. Um, open study course in health or like it's health and life sciences. So if you've completed one or two of those courses in health and life sciences, it's actually uh, improved for getting into the uh, into the process. Uh, the course, again, I told you was three years, and it's either at NEAT or at SAFE in Calgary, and I welcome any questions. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellen. So conveniently, um, speaking of the respiratory therapy program at NATE, um, we do have Graham Wurstuck, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to say that right, Graham, who's going to share a little bit of information about the um, RT program at NATE and things that high school students should be considering um, as they look into the different programs. So over to you, Graham. Hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, sticking with us this long here. Uh, shouldn't be too long here. I just wanted to build on what Ellen said there and uh, maybe tell you a little bit about the program and how it works, and as well, a little more background information about what an RT does. So uh, you guys can all see my slides and hear this okay? Great. You're good. Okay, so a respiratory therapist is what I think an exciting and important hands-on part of the medical field. 
Uh, we work with patients with heart and lung conditions. Here's a picture of some of our students right there. Um, way, one way to think about it is when you hear on the news that somebody's on life support or having issues like that, it's usually in our respiratory therapist who's doing that work. So we run the ventilators and things like that. So I'll just show you a couple of things here. These are your lungs out of a body that they're supposed to look like normally. Here's people who have been smoking a while or had occupational exposures that have maybe damaged their lungs. So this is one aspect of our patient population, but we also work with people who have cardiac issues, things like that. Anybody who's um, really, really sick is potentially our patient and all the way out to people who are wandering the community and things like that. So we deal with a wide spectrum of people, okay? Uh, here is all the areas you, you potentially could work as a respiratory therapist. So a lot of us are involved in critical care units. So the sickest of the sick patients, people who are you know, inches from death to use the expression, uh, both adults, pediatrics and babies, we're all involved in their care, running the breathing machines or the ventilators. As Ellen said, emergency departments, operating rooms, labor and delivery, uh, on the general floors, taking care of patients pulmonary function labs, so doing lung testing, and those results get fed back to doctors so that they can make diagnoses or treatment plans. And then in the community, we might be uh, setting up your grandpa with a CPAP machine so he can sleep better at night. Uh, and also delivering things like oxygen to patients at home and helping assess them and set them up with those sorts of things. Okay. Here's uh, on a, a Learjet that is going to being set up to transport a medical patient. So I got to do this before. That's another place RTs could work. Here's in an emergency room, they're dealing with a trauma. RTs are definitely involved there. Uh, you might be involved in the transport, putting in the airways, taking them for scans, things like that. Here's in the ICU where probably most of us are at home, uh, but in the rural environment, uh, like Ellen said, you might bounce around all over the place from moment to moment. So you might start your day and emerge and then go do some pulmonary function testing in the afternoon. Or maybe you're working with a community care company to uh, go help out people in their homes. Here's a little shot of a, a baby being ventilated. So neonatal ICU. Um, you, in the rural setting, you're going to help stabilize these patients so that they can come to the city, so they can live long enough so they can come to the city and get the care that they need so that they can be stabilized. Okay. So what are things that we do here? Like we said, we work with all different age groups there, all different walks of life. Uh, so big thing is airway management, okay? So you're sticking tubes in people, uh, sticking lines in people to help them to breathe. So at that moment, you know, if you're in a car accident, you can't breathe, maybe uh, you got some trauma around here, we're going to stick in a tube straight into your trachea so that we can attach you to a breathing machine. And respiratory therapists are a big part of that. We'll respond to emergency calls in the, in the hospital. So one way to think about this is we're kind of like paramedics, but within the hospital. Right, so anytime there's something big going on, somebody's, uh, you know, we're worried they're going to die. Uh, we're there, and on that note, we're also involved in CPR. So this is one of the part of my elevator pitch for respiratory therapy is we get some of the the guts and glory, uh, but as soon as the patient's alive and everything's okay, if there's anything going on downstairs that's not our job, the nurses will take care of that. So we get to show up, be the heroes for the moment, and then. I get out of there when things start to get messy elsewhere. <laughs> um, we'll, as Ellen said, we'll obviously are involved in education and not just teaching other RTs, but teaching other professions uh, about how to use the oxygen therapy equipment, about our roles, uh, teaching patients, you know, about smoking cessation, teaching them about how to live their best life, even though they have a lung disease. Like we said, lung function delivery, medical glass delivery, all those sorts of things. I just have broken out here by section here, but I've kind of talked about this. So again, in the ICUs, you'll be adjusting these breathing machines. Again, when they say on the news life support, this is usually what we're talking about here. You'll be assisting with intubations. That's putting the, the tube down somebody's throat, uh, putting in potentially art lines, assisting with bronchoscopy, where we'll put a camera down someone's lungs to check out what's going on. And again, emergency response. A lot of your job, like I said, most RTs are employed in the ICU ER kind of spectrum there. So a lot of our job is knowing about these technical machines and running blood samples to adjust them the right way to keep somebody uh, alive and, and to move them towards getting off that machine. Here's in a, uh, in a, again, a trauma room setting, responding to something like that. 
here's a, a student trying to put in that tube there to help somebody breathe there. And again, uh, with a baby, so in a neonatal thing. And not to gross anyone, here's some blood. Um, so one of the things we do is do arterial lines or arterial pokes. So nurses will do IVs and draw venous blood. We want the fresh blood because we want to see how your heart and lungs are working there. So we'll teach you how to do this. And then that'll be a big part of your job because that, that'll teach you or, or the information you get from that is to tell you whether this patient needs a tube or whether the settings need to go up and down. Like I said, we can work in the OR, uh, helping print in lines. Uh, there's actually a growing role within AHS, and this is a new program coming out here, where we will start to assist or supervise or help out with anesthesia. So um, as we look to cut healthcare costs and things like that, one way we can do this is to have airway professionals like RTs uh, run the anesthesia as long as there's an anesthetist supervising and directing uh, the case there we can be the people actually operating the machines and doing the airway and the patient prep. We also, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of ECMO, but you might hear heart-lung bypass machines in the news. So RTs play a pivotal role in running those machines. You could walk into uh, the pediatric ICU in Edmonton right now and see uh, an RT potentially running one of those machines there. In the community, like I said, we can run pulmonary function tests, help people with their oxygen, set up CPAP or BiPAP machines to help them uh, do that. Um, lots of entrepreneurial RTs, uh, especially in smaller communities, things like that, lots of entrepreneurial RTs set up their own company. And that's how you become a business owner as a healthcare professional to provide these services of getting people machines to help them sleep, delivering oxygen, things like that. So that's another way that you can sort of break out of the public health system, but still be involved in healthcare there. Okay, so what, what would make a good RT? Well, I won't read off all this list here, but obviously you gotta be compassionate, caring, have good communication skills. Um, but a big thing here is being a critical thinker. Like a lot of the other health professions, you're gonna be presented with unique problems every day. And so being able to think through a problem, we often joke about um, having to come up with solutions on the spot. We, we say MacGyver it, but I think that reference is lost in a lot of younger people now. Uh, but you know, often you have to come up and make something up on the spot that's going to work for this patient. And so uh, having those, being able to think under stressful situations when somebody's potentially dying in front of you and being able to come up with a solution uh, is a key part of it. Now, having said that, like I said, we do also do home care and community care. That's a bit less stressful, but still requires a good level of critical thinking and, um, and uh, problem solving under stress there. Okay. So as highlighted already, we are a three-year program, which is a bit longer than some of these other programs. But uh, as was mentioned in the chat, our wage is pretty competitive with nursing. So you get almost a nursing wage, but for one year less of education, which isn't a bad deal in my mind here. So your first year is going to be all theory and hands-on lab simulation. We've got two wonderful labs at NEAT that are fully equipped with all equipment you'd be using out in the field there. Lots and lots of hands-on experience. So uh, for people who are very tactile learners who want to hold something in their hand to understand it, you will get that opportunity, absolutely. Okay. In year two, we have, again, more classroom and theory, but then we give you four weeks of clinical practicum. And then in your third year, it's all clinical practicum. So you spend almost the whole year, plus or minus a couple of weeks there, uh, out in the hospital environment, home care environments, things like that, uh, dealing with real patients and being supervised by respiratory therapists. You'll see this word simulation up here. So Nate has one of the, uh, literally a world-class simulation lab where we can, uh, we can put you in the middle of a rave, a car accident, a hospital room, an OR, and simulate all those environments with high-tech mannequins that will blink and talk to you and uh, even pee the bed if we want them to, just as an example. So <laughs> they're, they're very uh, high-tech machines. And so you have access to those resources when you come to Nate to learn the job so that when you walk in and do something on a patient, it's not the first time you've done it. All right, uh, challenges, shift work, especially if you're working in a hospital environment, 12 hour shifts can be a lot. You are gonna be around infectious patients. Uh, I like to say we're, you know, we're in the splash zone here, especially with COVID that made it a, uh, a very apparent there. Our RTs were very much on the front line of that. And we will be part of critical incidents. So if you're working in merge or ICU, you're going to see some things that might be 
uh, troubling, but there are resources to help you there, okay? Uh, if you're willing to accept the challenges, we'd love to have you. It can be a very re rewarding career. Uh, employment is very good. As uh, our HS uh, representative indicated there, there's quite a few jobs open right now, and we only have so many graduates that we can process at one time here. Um, so the last several years has been you know, above 90% employment. And really and truly, uh, a lot of that, the, the few people who didn't get a job, often it comes down to um, their personal performance, not that there wasn't job opportunities or, to be had there. Okay? Again, wage is very competitive. I actually think that might be a little lowball because you know when you're young and you're graduated there, uh, if you're fairly ambitious, you clock a few overtime shifts and you can bump that yeah, fairly easily. Uh, I graduated, you know, uh, 12 years ago, and it was fairly easy to do 80 to 100K if you're willing to work some overtime with that. So uh, very rewarding fiscally as well as uh, you know, emotionally. Okay, so how do we get in? Well, we want you to have at least 70% in English, uh, math, biology, and chemistry, uh, and or proof of English language proficiency if you're English second language. Now, this is just the minimum. Uh, we do have quite a few applicants. So the last few years, it's been, you know, low to mid 80s to actually get your application looked at there. Uh, as Ellen highlighted there, we do have an alternative pathway or if you take one of our open studies courses, we will plop you right into the interview process, even if your grades uh, aren't uh, at a competitive average. So as long as you meet those minimums and you take one of our introductory courses, you can get into the program that way. Once, you're, once your application has been received, you have to go do an online interview. So this is what's called a, a mini medical interview. Basically, we ask you a, sort of a thinking question like, uh, you know, should we do forced, uh, not forced, but mandatory organ transplants or opt-in things, something like an ethical issue or something about the job. And we just want you to show us that you can critically think about an issue there. Uh, you don't have to be there's no right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of you being able to construct an argument on the spot, um, talk about things, you know, with communicate in a reasonable way, and we rate you and score you on that. And then from there, you'd be accepted into the program. Okay. A uh, couple key things: we have some provincial and national organizations that we follow and have to obey the rules of. And then, if there's any big questions, of course, you could just Google. Uh, NATE Respiratory Therapy or SATE Respiratory Therapy will have a full page of a lot of this information. Uh, but if you have any specific questions, you can email our program here. Okay? And of course, I'll hang out as well to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was um, some really great information. Our last speaker of the evening is Sarah McDonald, and she's going to talk about next steps for you. She is a senior advisor of student engagement and youth career development um, with AHS. And she's a graduate of the University of New Brunswick and Medicine Hat College. And she's been with AHS for almost 15 years in a variety of roles. She's a busy mom who loves to golf and play volleyball and is passionate about working in healthcare, even without a healthcare related degree. So over to you, Sarah. Okay, so uh, like Colleen shared, my name is Sarah McDonald. I am with Alberta Health Services, and I always, you know, I kind of make that joke about not being a healthcare professional, but working in healthcare. I have a bachelor's of business uh, with a HR, sort of an HR degree-ish type thing. It's languaged a little different out east, but I didn't really know what I was going to do coming out of school. I had an aunt who was a nurse. And I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. I had an aunt who was in human resources who made it sound really cool. Uh, I feel like she fibbed just a little or embellished a lot, one of the two. <laughs> so, and, and that's how I learned about human resources when I was a young person. And so I think that young people today, you have a really great opportunity to learn about a lot more careers than, than I did. And I know it only looks like I was in high school a couple of years ago, but it was actually close to 20. Um, no, it's exactly 20. <laughs> but 
you, you have this opportunity to have these wonderful engagement events to meet other people in your communities or meet other people online to learn about what a career actually and truly is. Because we get a little bit of deception that came at us from the TV shows that we were really into. Uh, watching ER, I just thought, gosh, that looks like the coolest place in the world to work, but I, I wouldn't be able to handle the stress. It turns out it's not quite like that even, and I'm not sure ER is maybe the best reference for this age group, Grey's Anatomy, but like way more soap opera -y. So, you know, getting these opportunities to learn about the opportunities that exist is just so much value. So, oh, it didn't click. There we go. So what opportunities are there? And when I speak, I'm speaking exclusively about Alberta, about Alberta Health Services, but there are opportunities with private employers as well that can focus on a lot of our allied health careers. So in for our junior high, we have a program called Take Our Kids to Work, and it happens in the second week of November. And during COVID, it was online, but it is intended for kids to young people for youth to have an opportunity to see a career and some sites will operate it different and it doesn't have to be with a parent and that's one thing we just want to stress it can be with someone a guardian someone you trust a friend and this allows you to come on site for a day and see what they do and then some programs exist in your local community do you have is an example being Cam, uh, Cam Rose, there's a program called the Young Medical Minds. So does something exist? Our path will put on other high school events. So ensuring that you're aware and connected and know what's going on so that you can take advantage of that. And then high school, we have Job Shadow, which is not quite back on the table, but we're working on it. Hopefully soon. Uh, the pandemic has thrown a lot of cracks in the sidewalk. And then there's volunteering. So we will put and send out the link, sorry, send out the link for volunteering. And most of our sites accept volunteers. It is a commitment. Uh, they expect a certain amount of hours. And you have to do the full criminal, I, criminal records check, immunization, et cetera. But it is a great opportunity to get into the body of healthcare. There's some paid employment opportunities. They're a little few and far between, but if you keep your eye on our on our careers website. You, there might be some that come up for high school students. And then we also participate in the high school work experience uh, program where you can apply for high school credits uh, while you're doing, if you say have a job as a food service worker with Alberta Health Services. And then when it comes to your post-secondary, again, job shadow, great opportunity. And some uh, programs in post-secondary actually require you to job shadow prior to getting into the program. There's more volunteering, always. Uh, placements, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then other paid employment opportunities, as well as co-op programs. So co-op programs exist in a few different areas, uh, IT, biomed, uh, I think accounting as well, where you get an opportunity to go to school and do a paid placement. And then, so I alluded a little bit about the placement. So AHS takes on students in all varieties. And I know this is a very specific allied health conversation today, but I wanted to highlight that we support thousands, um, I'll give you the actual number, but it's 25,000 different student placements occurred in AHS last year. Uh, it's over 4 million hours of placements that are, so you're working with someone. So the volume that we give back to the students in good faith to help better you for your future is such an invaluable experience when you get that. Even if you look at our, um, like our diagnostic imaging, for example, they had 300,000 hours in placements. So like I said, over 25,000 placements and over 4 million hours. So again, I alluded to a little bit about the other programs that we have. I'm, I'm trying to be quick here because I know I've, I've uh, been the ringer. I'm, I'm going to get the hook eventually. <laughs> so I apologize for how quickly I'm talking. But prior to COVID, we had taken, there were 355 grade nine students who came as take our kids to work. We had 190 students who participated in one or two day hospital experiences. 546 job shadows that we have on record, as well as several high school placements. This next slide that I'm going to show you 
I just want to preface, these are the only the ones that I could think of. So this, here are some of the jobs that exist at Alberta Health Services. And again, these are just the ones that I could think of in the fifth, almost 15, I don't have Sid 16 years experience at AHS, but as you can see that, you know, they're one of the benefits of working for an organization like AHS when you go into an employment opportunity is that you may go to school to be a respiratory therapist and have a really great and enriching career. And then your life path may change a little and you have an opportunity to go into management, human resources. Is there another path that you, you'd like to go down? And that very likely exists with Alberta Health Services. We have so many opportunities where you can start prior to going to post-secondary to work during post-secondary while you're in high school, like I said, volunteering, working in our food services. It's really an opportunity for you to transition your career and your life together. And when we think about rural, we quite often, from our perspective in human resource, we like to think about how your family will locate itself into a rural community. And with Alberta Health Services, more often than not, there's a job opportunity for you and your partner when you, if you're going to move to a rural community. So just trying to give, it's really, I feel like I'm just giving the tip of the iceberg about what I'd love to talk to you about. I'm really passionate about creating opportunities for people at Alberta Health Services and just helping young people understand what it'll look like in your future. Your path doesn't have to be straight. You don't have to know today what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And so the question we often get is what do I need to do? And you know what, you have such an opportunity at this time in the world and this time in your life. So you tell me, right? You help, you help yourself by finding the information, participating in events like this, and you know, volunteering, job shadow, all of those really quality opportunities will help you grow to the potential that you are. I'm not in that note. I feel like I just like. <laughs> and we didn't even have to like pull, get the old hook out, Sarah. So. I've got my watch telling me that it's <laughs> like the 15 minute warning went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Um, so much good information. And uh, thank you so much. Um, the first question is really for anyone, I think it's a general question. How did you afford to go to school? And did you get student loans to get there? I can answer from a personal perspective. Uh, I was also a student athlete, which helped a little bit. I got a few scholarships, but I also got a number of academic scholarships from school. But I didn't qualify for the Canada Student Loan Program. And, but that being said, it's a really great program that if you go in to be a nurse, not that we're talking about nursing today, uh, there is a Canada Student Loan Forgiveness Program that is attached to rural communities as well. We're currently uh, working with the federal government to see if we can expand that to allied health positions. Uh, so stay tuned. And there is scholarships with AHS, such as the NADC, so that's the Northern uh, Alberta Sorry, Develop so Development Council. So you can also look on the AHS website. Sometimes there's scholarships there or bursaries. Sorry, bursaries. Yeah. If you're um, if you have relatives that are currently with AHS, some of the universe or some of the unions offer um, scholarships or bursaries. Um, to their employees, uh, siblings, or children. I personally, when I went back to school, I um, got a student loan. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the things that you can look at also is um, uh, EI. Um, sometimes EI will sponsor you to go back to school too. Yeah, not, not much to add, but the traditional way. Like, so I had a combination of scholarships, uh, student loans, I definitely needed those, and then part-time jobs over the summer and uh, on weekends. In the chat box, um, Alicia wrote, one of the things I would encourage everyone to do is look into every scholarship, especially uh, coming right out of school. There are so many scholarships with schools, with your high school, community, volunteering, etc., <clears throat> and millions of dollars go unused every year. Uh, so 
read that post. Um, then there's a question that just popped in the chat box. This one is for the respiratory therapist. I don't know where I heard this, but at some point I heard that it's actually quite rare to successfully resuscitate a patient in an emergency scenario. Is that true? It depends on context. Um, in hospital, obviously it's a little bit better than out in the community. Um, having access to an AED and good CPR makes all the difference in the world. Um, the reality is, yeah, it's, it's less than 10% most of the time, uh, but there's lots of different factors. So don't let that stop you from doing CPR and, and make sure you get CPR certified as soon as possible. What, what you said, um, it depends on the condition they're in when they come in as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of circumstances around that and it, it's um, hard to say uh, it works for everybody, but it, it doesn't work for everybody too. So um, when you do successfully resuscitate somebody, it, it's a pretty good feeling. Thanks for sharing. Um, there is another question here. Are there programs for our First Nation students out there? I can speak for Nate just really quickly. They're just starting a new process. I don't have all the details, but there's um, yet another pathway for uh, First Nation students to get admittance into programs, uh, but you'd have to reach out to Nate Registrar to get those details. Uh, but we do have another pathway for you to, to get in um, a, an outside of the, our normal ways as well. Uh, the last question that I had sent to me, is there a regulatory body um, that governs respiratory therapists um, and how much are the annual dues? Yeah, so the easy one first is uh, 425 uh, bucks every year to maintain your license. Um, we, at, we're regulated at the provincial level in Alberta. Other provinces don't have a provincial regulatory body, so they get uh, regulated at the national level. But yeah, we do have, there's a, what's called a national competency framework. So every RT has to meet this minimum standard. And once you're graduated from a program, you're not done yet. You have to pass a licensing exam that is administered across the country. So. Super, and I guess uh, for speech and language as well, is there a regulatory body? For therapy assistance? Yes. No. There's not, they're not regulated. Yeah, we, we, I can talk a little bit about it. I was on um, an association for 10 years, the Therapy Assistant Association of Alberta, the abbreviation is THAW. Um, and we've made several attempts at regulating. I'm not on the association anymore. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing basically because we fall under many different categories, SLPA, OTA, PTA. <laughs> Uh, rec therapy assistant so it's it's been it was a little bit of a struggle has not happened we've got what's called the health professions act and that act requires certain prof professions to be regulated so they have to meet uh, minimum standards um, based on the health professions act thank you guys so much for uh for attending and all your uh, questions and everything. And thank you to all of our wonderful presenters. So we appreciate you helping us plant the seed of uh, why rural and uh, with the allied rural healthcare professional career. So thank you guys. Have a good night, everybody.